Hi and welcome to Autodesk Eagle webinar. Wish to um, really appreciate that your attendance and joining us today. And with me today is uh, Jorge Garcia. Yeah, hi guys. I'm the support specialist for Autodesk Eagle. I'm Ed Robledo. I'm also part of the Autodesk Eagle support team as well, and I'll be your host today. Now, our sp our, our guest panelist today is Mr. Uh, George Safadopoulos. Uh, avid ham radio and also a co-host of the ham radio 360 hey george could you tell us just a little bit about yourself before we begin sure thing edwin uh, hello to you and to jorge and all the people listening today so thank you for joining us so my interest in electronics goes back to when i was a kid and like to build and take apart things and i found out as i played around more with electronics, that amateur radio was a great hobby that you could uh, express yourself in and do some useful work at the same time. And so I've been a licensed ham radio operator for several years and enjoy building a lot of my own projects. And that's Thank what- Thank you very uh, much, kind of Excellent. Okay, cool. Uh, and that's when you got introduced to using Eagle uh, to take care of these, uh, um, these projects that you're working with? Yeah, because you know, in the in the earlier days, we would uh, breadboard a project with point-to-point -point wiring, and and uh, these days, it's so easy to do your own printed circuit boards, and so inexpensive that there's there's kind of no point of doing it the old-fashioned way by hand wiring. So, um, a lot of the projects just get done doing custom circuit boards. Okay, very well. So uh, you could go ahead and share your screen if you want to. In the meantime, let me just let everybody remind that if you have any questions throughout the presentation, go ahead and put them on the chat room. Uh, Jorge or myself will do our best to go ahead and feel those those questions. Also, as a user, um, uh, George is going to be sharing his screen at the same time. Uh, there will be a PowerPoint running on the top side right corner of the screen. Uh, you can go ahead and um, expand that screen if necessary, if you wanted to see it any bigger at the same time. Okay. So um, with no further ado, hey, George, uh, please uh, take over. Thank you, and thank you very much, George, for being here. Sure, you bet. My pleasure. Uh, so what I thought I would do before we dive into the circuit design is walk you through a couple slides with a bit of background. So as a starting point, as Edwin mentioned, I'm the co-host of the Ham Radio 360 Workbench podcast. And that's a podcast that was uh, developed originally by Kale Nelson, K4CDN, who's the host of the show and the, the podcast godfather of our ham radio shows. And Kale's been doing that show for about three years now. And I had the uh, opportunity to be on the show and talk about some things I've worked on with another friend, Jeremy uh, Cullinay, KF7IJZ. And after a while, we decided that we would produce a new podcast called The Workbench. So currently, we put out a show every week. So one week will be the broad Ham Radio 360 podcast and then Every other week is our Workbench podcast, where Jeremy and I get to dive deeper into hands-on ham radio projects. And for a lot of those projects, we use Eagle for the printed circuit board design um, and the layout. So what we're going to talk about today is a project that we came up with. And one of the reasons we wanted to do projects is to give amateur radio operators a, a opportunity to design and build and get hands-on experience which is everything from circuit design to the actual physical board design to assembly and testing an electronic gadget. So the thing that, um, that we've, we've worked on for this particular uh, project is a 12 volt DC power management device. And I want to switch the slides. Edwin, could you switch the PowerPoint slide? Absolutely. So this sure is a block thing. diagram uh, that shows a bit of the Thank you. That shows a bit of the application. So uh, what we're going to describe here is very, very useful for an amateur radio operator, but it can also be a very useful device for people who are camping or are doing disaster relief and need portable power, and you need ways to manage that kind of power. So the application is simply this, that a lot of the equipment that's used in the field operates on 12 volts DC. And 
in our case, as amateur radio operators, that's typically a radio, but it could also be accessories, like it could be lights, it could be some other devices. We've got other folks who need backup battery systems for medical equipment uh, and so forth. So normally what you would do is you would uh, charge up a battery and you'd run your equipment off that battery. And that's fine, but uh, what we wanted to do is build more of a system which allows you to run that 12 volt radio or equipment off of a 120 volt AC power supply, which converts down to 12 volts DC to run the equipment and also have a battery so that when the AC power fails, what this device will do is automatically fail over to the battery. So what that means is that uh, normally you're running off the power supply when the AC mains are operational, but when the AC goes out, the battery picks up and the devices, the load, which would be radios and lights and other accessories, never skips a beat. It just continues to operate. The other thing we wanted to do with this kind of a circuit was to make sure that we didn't discharge the battery beyond a safe level. So with a 12 volt sealed lead acid battery, a, a typical uh, marine deep cycle battery or a sealed lead acid battery, as you pull the power from the battery, the voltage of the cells goes down. And uh, there's a certain point at which if you pull any more energy from the battery, you'll damage the cells. And by damage, what I mean is it'll be difficult to recharge the battery. It'll shorten the life of the battery. So you want to make sure you don't run the battery down too low. So the first requirement for this design is to be able to switch between the power supply and the battery automatically. And then the second feature is to make sure that we disconnect the circuit. So let's go to the next slide and we'll show you a, a logical block diagram of, of the design. So here what you see is on the left hand side the two inputs. So input one would be the 12 volts coming from your power supply. Input two would be the 12 volts coming from the battery. Once it comes into the board there's two large power FETs. Those FETs are essentially electronic switches that turn on the flow of current from one source or the other. And there's an integrated circuit, an LTC4414 chip, that monitors the voltage of the two sources. And depending on whichever voltage is higher, it will gate one or the other of the two inputs onto the rest of the circuit. The next thing that it goes through is the current sensor, because we want to measure the current and the voltage. So there's a high current Hall effect sensor then after the current sensor, it goes through a latching relay before it goes to the output to the load. Now, the reason for the relay, as I mentioned, we don't want to damage the battery. So we're monitoring the voltage constantly. And when the battery voltage goes down below a safe threshold, typically about 10 and a half to 11 volts, then we want the relay to open up and prevent current from flowing to the load and stop the discharge of the battery at that point. So to do that, we decided to put an Arduino microcontroller on the board. So the Arduino does a couple things. The first thing it does is it monitors that voltage and makes sure that it's in the safe operating voltage above about 10 and a half to 11 volts. And in that state, the, the relay's on. When the voltage drops below that safe state, then the relay opens up. The other thing the Arduino can do is also monitor the current from the Hall effect sensor and then send that data somewhere. So you can send that data out through a serial port or to an LCD display that you would mount on the box that the device is, is, in, is housed in. Uh, one other note is when we picked the relay, we had to pick a relay that had sufficient current capacity for the application, but also we wanted to use a latching relay, not a conventional relay. So the difference, of course, is that conventional relay, when the relay is energized, it constantly draws current and since this is running potentially off battery, you don't want to be in a situation where the device itself is sucking current just to keep itself running and adding to the load. So a latching relay allows you to turn the circuit on and turn the circuit off with just a short pulse of voltage on the coil. So that eliminates the overhead of the relay coil voltage from the load. So that's the basic design. There were several considerations in the design for uh, how do we make this thing robust and reliable. So uh, we wanted to do the auto switching that's accomplished by the LTC chip. We wanted to monitor that's accomplished by the Arduino. Um, and then the physical constraint was 
how do we know if the circuit board is capable of handling enough current? So in this application, one of the specs is the maximum current that could flow through the circuit safely to the output before the circuit heats up or is damaged. So uh, there's two ways you can think about uh, setting the, the, the size of the traces. One way is, is the width of the trace. And the good news is you don't have to really know a lot about calculating this because there's sources on the web that you can go to and plug in the numbers and it will tell you what the safe maximum capacity is for the PC board trace. So the second thing you can do is also change the uh, thickness of the copper. So when you think about designing a board, the default normal uh, current that, or uh, uh, thickness of that would be what is called one ounce copper. That's a normal small signal kind of um, thickness. But some of the, uh, the board houses will let you go to a thicker copper, a two ounce or a three ounce copper. And it turns out if you, if you use the outside traces of the circuit board, the top and the bottom layers, so that those copper traces are exposed to the air, you can make a trade-off of trace width and copper thickness. So if the uh, thickness of the trace you need is, let's say, uh, half an inch to get the capacity you want at one inch, you could reduce that trace thickness by one half down to a quarter of an inch if you bump up the thickness of the copper from one ounce to two ounce. So it's a linear relationship between the thickness and the width of the copper. So for this particular application, we wanted to really over design it. So we went with a thicker copper. We chose a three ounce copper that allows us to get away with, uh, with smaller traces and still handle the, the current that we wanted to take care of. So uh, that's a bit about the, uh, the block diagram. Let's go on to the next slide. So this is a picture of the beta version of the circuit board. So what you'll see here is along the bottom are the power connectors. So in the amateur radio world, the common DC power connector is an Anderson power pole. And you can see three pairs of power pole connectors along the bottom. The first two are for the two DC inputs, typically the power supply input on one port and the uh, battery on the second port. And then the third port is the 12 volt output to the load. You can think about the current basically flowing up and over to the right and then down and out of the circuit. So you can see two big power FETs that are mounted right behind the connectors. Just behind that in the center is a black square with two big leads. That's the Hall effect current sensor. And then to the right, the orange box is a latching relay. And then the traces come out the, uh, the power pole on the right. Now, one thing you'll also notice is that there's a lot of board space where the relay is, and you'll see the footprint of another component around that relay. And the reason for that is because we wanted to put in either a smaller relay or a larger relay. The smaller relay, the orange one here, will handle about 15 amps, and the larger footprint relay will handle about 30 amps if you replace it with the larger one. Now, why didn't we just go with the larger relay is simply a cost factor because the smaller relay is only about $4, but that larger relay is, um, is about $20. So it's significantly more expensive and uh, the builder can choose whichever relay they, they want to put in there. What you'd also see on that circuit board is um, a power supply module in the upper left-hand corner. Let me and, just load it again. For some reason, yeah. we lost it. Sorry about that. Yeah, I see the image is gone. Yeah, okay. hang on. Standing Give by. me a second. Let me go ahead and load it again. Um, so if you look at the upper left-hand corner, you see a small circuit board about a half an inch by about three quarters of an inch. And that is a switching regulator. These are regulator modules that are made by Oki Murata. And it's an entire switching power supply in a very small package with a pinout that's basically the same as the uh, good old 7805 linear uh, regulators. <clears throat> so it's very easy to work with this. And the reason why we used a switching supply module rather than a linear regulator is because of the, uh, the voltage drop. So the voltage drop through a circuit like this is going to be significant. You're gonna go from typically about 13.8 or 14 volts down to five volts and then you multiply that by the current and you get a significant heat dissipation on a linear regulator. If you're only drawing uh, 20 milliamps, it doesn't matter, but if you're gonna draw 
let's say a couple hundred milliamps, then all of a sudden this starts to make a difference. So in a way, uh, it's over-designed. We could have gotten away with the linear regulator, but this gives us one more um, kind of level of margin on top of um, the regular linear regulator. You'll also see in the lower left-hand corner, that's the Arduino. So a lot of you know what an Arduino is, of course, and you tend to think about these as a circuit board about three by two inches. So there's a lot of different versions of Arduinos out there. And the one that we chose to use for this project is called an Arduino uh, Pro Micro. And the Pro Micro is made by SparkFun, and you could buy that off their, their website. And uh, there's other sources for these as well. So uh, that's the processor, and we only use a few pins on that device, but we need the analog to digital converters, conference. as well as the logic output to control the relay. So I think, um, I think that may be the last slide uh, of, of the design. Maybe we go to one more. Uh, we'll skip over this, and I'll show you this interactively on the, uh, in Eagle. Um, and then the last thing I want to mention is uh, all of our build project info on the next slide is is on our website so uh, the design files are all open source you can go download the schematic and board files you can download uh, the firmware that goes in the design so it's a it's an open source community project and everybody's welcome to um, go ahead and use those design files the first project we did you can see here on the screen that's a different board we did with eagle this is an antenna analyzer that uses a digital synthesis chip and an op amp and some discrete components and will analyze your antenna to determine the operating frequency so you can tune your antenna properly. So all the projects we build, we, we put up there on the 360workbench.com webpage and you can download the files. So with that, uh, let me switch over to, uh, to show you a little bit about the design. So here you can see um, the, the schematic diagram. So the circuit is pretty straightforward. Uh, the input is 12 volts that comes off of the the two um, inputs actually let's let's move up to that so let's start with the inputs so, so these two connectors here and here are the two 12 volt inputs those are those anderson power pole connectors uh, those two um, inputs then go into these two power fets now when we designed the circuit originally we we picked a transistor that had um, fairly low on resistance. And since then, we've found one that's even better. And so the next version of this board will, will go to a new transistor that has a super low on resistance. The advantage of that is it reduces the heat uh, dissipation. So the original transistor we picked had about a 70 milliohm on resistance, which was ridiculously high. That was obviously a mistake. And we replaced it with one with about a 4.7 uh, ohm milliohm on resistance. And that's fine. And we've subsequently found one with about 1.7 milliohms on resistance. So it'll be super low heat dissipation. But it's a different package. It's a surface mount package, whereas this one is a more of a flat pack uh, package. So the, uh, uh, let's see, the, the inputs, as you can see there on the left, each feed into the two power fets. Uh, we also sample those two inputs, and you can see up and to the right, there's a, there's a pair of voltage dividers created with resistors. Those feed the two analog to digital converter inputs on the Arduino. So that's how we measure the, uh, the power supply in and the battery in voltage, as well as the 12-volt uh, output voltage on the Arduino. And there you see in the middle, this is the, um, the power control device. This is the linear technology 4414. And that device is also monitoring the voltage uh, on, on the two uh, sources and then generating the, the gate control voltage that biases on one or the other of those two transistors. Uh, this here is the uh, ACS758, which is the Hall Effect Current Sensor by Allegro Micro. Uh, this is a really easy component to use because it's a three-terminal device for the uh, microcontroller side plus the two power tabs. So you simply put the current through the two big power tabs, and then the other three pins go to power ground, and there's an output pin. The output pin is a DC voltage that's proportional to the current that's being drawn through the device. So if you get a 50 amp device, this will generate between 2.5 to 5 volts, 
and you just read that voltage with the ADC input on the Arduino, and you can easily convert that into a current. So you'll know what the current is passing through the device. Here you can see the two latching relays. There's a small one and a large one, as I mentioned on the footprint. So on the circuit board, we overlaid those two footprints. And so of course you can only put in one or the other, and they're essentially wired in parallel. And then the output goes to our last Anderson power pole connector, which is the load connector. Hey, George, Down below we have here a question you... from... Oh, sure. George? Yeah, we have a question from Steve Custer. He say, he's asking, are the inputs actually running 12 volts or are they up to 13.8? What's uh, the range for those? Uh, that's a good question. So the, the circuit can handle um, well in excess of that voltage. So the, uh, the specs for the radio equipment that we normally use in amateur radio and uh, virtually any mobile two-way radios uh, in, in the public safety world are, are typically rated at 13.8 volts as their uh, preferred uh, supply voltage with a tolerance of plus and minus 15%. So that means that we have to be able to support at least 15% over the 13.8. So we have to go up into the 15 to 16 volt region um, to be safe. But the circuit is really over-designed, so you, you, could, you could run more power into it. We don't anticipate anybody putting more than 16 volts into it, but it would easily handle that. So if we had to come up with a spec for maximum input voltage, I would say it's, let's say, 20 volts, and everything would work fine. Um, but that would be the, the target voltage that, that we would spec it at. Okay, perfect. Um, so here you He's can happy. see the Arduino. Um, where oh, there's only a few pins that are really used on the Arduino. Uh, we're, we're reading the, uh, the voltages, we're reading the current, and uh, then a few output, uh, those are the A's. You can see A0 is power supply in, A1 is battery in voltage, uh, A2 is the output voltage, and A3 is the current sensor um, that tells us the current as it, it, it ex expressed as voltages. And then there's some digital control lines, the relay set and reset pins. Uh, those run up through a buffer. This is a, uh, a good old uh, Darlington pair buffer, 2803. And then that runs up to the two um, coils on the, um, the relays. So the relays that we use are uh, the type that have a single common uh, voltage point, And then you pulse the other two ends of the relays to put it into the set or reset condition. Now, you could easily have replaced I've left this. the conference this uh, 2803 with a pair of transistors, that would work fine. Uh, but um, we happen to have this part, so we put it in the circuit and it works great. The other connector we put on the board is an I2C jack. So you see the uh, SDA and SCL lines uh, going to the uh, four pin jack. This is what uh, jumpers to the LCD display to display the, um, the voltage and the current. So that's the circuit. It's, it, in essence, it's, it's pretty basic, um, and the big consideration was partly the logic of it, but uh, the big consideration was really the, uh, the physical design, uh, you know, the current handling capacity. So uh, this is the board layout. You'll notice that the board is kind of a stretched octagon. The reason it's this shape is because we picked a, uh, a case to mount it in, so it fits in a poly case, a plastic case that uh, has flanges. So the board will fit in the case with a lid on top, and then there's screw holes so you can mount this uh, to a box or to the wall or whatever is convenient. So you'll, you'll notice here that the, the inputs, um, we always run uh, top and bottom traces to maximize the current capacity of the circuit. So uh, you'll see the two inputs, uh, ground and 12 volts to the left and in the center. Uh, there's very large holes for the... Uh, the, the pins that come off of those Anderson connectors. The connectors are rated for 45 amps. This is uh, really above the rated uh, capacity of the circuit, so that's plenty. You can see the two power FETs there. The original power FETs were, were in a um, more of a flat pack configuration with a tab and then two pins. The lower on resistance version, the next one that you see here, is in one of these uh, eight pin um, SO uh, type of uh, packages where several of the pins are, are bussed together. So there's essentially a, uh, an input, an output, and a control pin, if you want to think about it logically. And then this little guy in the middle is that linear technology uh, switching chip that tells the power FETs to switch on and off. The output of the two FETs go into this 
uh, big region here and into the big tab of the current sensor. So the current flows in this uh, big circle on the left and out uh, to the ring on the right. And then uh, over to the relay contacts and then the output relay contacts to the output uh, power pole connector. So when we designed the circuit, like I mentioned before, the, probably the biggest consideration was making sure that the board had sufficient current handling capacity. So it's probably over designed for the application, but we wanted to make sure there was plenty of headroom. This board is a two layer board. There's nothing exotic about it. We did it with all through hole components except for the LTC chip and the power FETs because those components are only available in a surface mount uh, configuration. And the reason why we did uh, through hole is because this is being made as a, a board that you'll build yourself. So it's much easier for people to do through hole uh, uh, construction than surface mount. And some people do surface mount uh, quite easily, but a lot of people, especially as a hobbyist, that may not be your, your thing to do surface mount uh, construction. So we thought we'd go with, uh, with traditional through hole components, which is also partly uh, why it's the size that it is. So that's the basic design. Uh, you'll see the Arduino there on the left. Uh, the header on the far left going to the I2C display. Uh, the voltage regulator, it'll look familiar to those of you who know the 7805, except the pins are reversed. Uh, the reason the pins are reversed is that uh, there's different versions of that regulator. This one, uh, we wanted to mount horizontally, and the way the pins pop out of the board, uh, you when you flip the regulator over, the pins reverse. So you'll see that the input is on the, on the right-hand side and the output's on the left. And um, otherwise, there's a fair bit of space around the board. One thing that I really liked about doing this with uh, this version of Eagle is I can see all the trace names on the, uh, the, the net names on the traces. So sometimes when you're looking at which trace you want to fatten up or skinny down, you really want to know if that's a, a power bus or a control signal. And so you'll, you'll know um, uh, exactly what signal you're looking at and make those adjustments accordingly. So that's, uh, that's the circuit and that's the application. Um, let's see if, if we have any other, uh, any other questions. Uh, um, do you, okay, so if anybody has any questions right now for the current design that he has displayed, um, go ahead and, and we'll go ahead and take care of those right now. As, as as so far you guys aren't this hasn't been manufactured to like somebody could buy this one I know the antenna analyzer was purchasable for a time I don't yeah, know yeah so good question one. so we did make a, a run of 50 boards and uh, in our beta and that's with the original transistors and we took those boards to the Dayton uh, ham fest and um, and and sold all the boards and we basically sell the boards at our cost so, uh, so all the beta boards were gone, and we're going to make another batch of boards. Normally for these build projects, we just make a blank board, and, and then we point uh, uh, people who want to buy, uh, you know, build this thing to the usual distributors for components and provide a bill of materials, and you buy the components yourself and then assemble it. Um, for this one, since we had this really super tiny LTC chip, we decided to have those pre-mounted. So... Uh, this particular circuit board we had fabricated through Seed Studio in China. And uh, I've done several boards with them. They, they have good service. And this is the first time we did one with any uh, components uh, mounted to the board. So the two power FETs and the LTC chip were mounted. And, um, and that was an interesting experience just to figure out how to do that. And uh, the, the, only, um, the only thing that's really uh, different between that and just doing a raw board is the lead time to get components. So typically, a, a raw board we can get um, out of China within a couple weeks without a rush. And if you're going to do a board with components, they have to get the parts and inventory them and all that. And that usually takes longer. So it took about a month from the time we submitted the design to the time that they were able to ship the, uh, the boards to us. Now, we will have uh, new boards. We don't have a scheduled date yet, but if people check back on the website and listen to the podcast, we'll be announcing when the, the next version of the boards are available. What has been like difficult for you as far as getting the manufacturing done? Um, I think that the the biggest challenge is conveying to the assembly house exactly what components you want to use. 
And sometimes uh, if you use an odd component, then you have to consign it. You know, in other words, you have to get it yourself and then send it to them if they'll do that. Uh, in other cases, it's just tedious. So w we did a board that had about 100 components on it. And even with the board manufacturers that have automated uh, bill of material systems, they only guess the component right about one out of three times. <laughs> so uh, a lot of times the, the, the assembly houses will, will guess the part and, and it'll be way off. You know, we'll, we'll put in 10K resistor and it'll come back and say, we don't know which resistor do you want. Did you want the 10K or the 100K or the 200K or something crazy like that? And well, I wanted the 10K because that's what the value attribute said. And so you have to, you know, pick through the bomb and make sure that the that you tell them exactly what component to use in the design. So that's not hard, but if, if you've got a board with 50 to 100 parts or more, it's just incredibly tedious and, and, and no fun at all. But of course, once you get that figured out, then, you know, reordering boards is easy, but that that's the most annoying part. Excellent. So one thing I've so, really noticed that, uh, uh, Jorge, in the last few years is there are so many new companies that are doing um, no-touch services where you submit your design and they'll send you the board. So the price is coming down, which is great. And I think over time that, that whole bill material thing is going to get better. Yeah, and definitely we have plans to improve that, that situation in Eagle as well. So hopefully yeah, you know, I, once I that, that comes in, then I mean... I think the more uh, connection you can make between the design tool and the sourcing of the components, the better. So, for example, for the antenna analyzer, uh, when you go to our website, if you want to buy the components, there's a single click, and it'll take you to DigiKey, and it'll it'll populate your shopping cart with the 21 parts that you can get from DigiKey. So that makes it super easy. So anything we could do that moves closer and closer to that, um, I think you'll see really an uptick in doing more revs of boards and more boards because it just will make it so much easier. Excellent. It Excellent. Seems like there's, That's really good information. So. Yeah, it seems like there's no, yeah, so the no other question. The board, uh, is, is really gotten so, so easy. Uh, and frankly, the availability of component libraries uh, is really good. And, and building your own parts is, is not bad. I mean, of course, some of these things on this board, like the big relay, we had to do our own uh, uh, component uh, footprint and schematic symbol for that. Same with the Hall Effect sensor. But, um, you know, 90% or more of the components that we ever use in a project are just, you know, available from one of a, a several libraries. So that's uh, that's really a big, big uh, help for sure. Excellent. So I think someone's typing a question. Let's see what, what we get. Let's give a, give a moment. Okay. Okay. Here we go. On the output of the FETs, are those a bunch of vias to tie the two planes together? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So if you if you look here at um, these six um, these six vias, those were to tie the two planes together. So uh, so the output of the FET is uh, these um, these three pins that you see along the top of the transistor, and they're soldered to the top layer, the red layer. And that's obviously connected to the input of the of the current sensor over here, but we wanted to double the current capacity, so we we parallel uh, the same uh, or almost exactly the same layout on the bottom layer, and um, at that big tab of the um, current sensor, that's a through hole component, so you solder both sides, but the the tie into the lower uh, side near the FET are those uh, are those vias. Excellent. And by the way, if, if there's anybody who has more experience with this than I do, I would appreciate any any tips for uh, for, <laughs> for placing the vias. So we, we, we have another uh, can question. Can you move here's... items around uh, to – yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, go for it. You read it. Okay. Uh, so the question is, is uh, let's see, uh, can you move items around uh, to avoid heat issues? So um, I was concerned about heating uh, be by having the traces be too small. In fact, uh, the very early prototype of the board, uh, we, we made the board and only put wires on it and, and shorted all of the 
um, the pads between the the, um, the the islands between the uh, the input and the output, and we we sent it to a friend of ours who has some very high current uh, power supplies and could measure the uh, the temperature. So we we over designed the circuit. So the the width of the copper and the thickness uh, we just kind of jacked it up to, <laughs> to the thickest copper that was available and uh, the the fattest trace that we could actually make fit, and uh, and it worked fine. So if if we were really space constrained, uh, we would reduce the trace sizes or cost constrained would reduce it to two ounce or one ounce copper, and there'd be a point where um, you know would would hit would hit a heating issue. Um, but we we didn't really have a way to calculate that um, when we did the design. We just built it and uh, over-engineered it with a lot of headroom and then measured the result in the lab. So it was really kind of the brute force technique. I, I wish I could say that there was a, a more effective heat um, you know, measurement capability there, but we didn't have a way to do that. Um, the, uh, how useful the... was the auto-router? Did you auto-route... Um, Sorry. Yeah, no, I was going to say that. Okay, how the useful was a... the auto router? So for this design. What, what George, were you, you there? No, no, just making sure that you didn't drop yeah, out. Here. No, what I was going to say is that the ARRL handbook oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, specifies that for you know one ounce copper, every ten mils can hold about of width can hold about five hundred milliamps you can also use something called the Saturn PCB tool to do some rudimentary calculations on on current capacity so that can can make your life easier in the future yeah actually that um, that uh, estimation is is very helpful um, we essentially use this that same number um, and yeah. then we verified it I believe it's advanced circuits which is a, a good PCB house uh, mm -hmm. Advanced Circuits has a calculator on their website. So if you just just go to, to Google uh, PCB Current Calculator, um, that'll probably be the one that pops up, and you can just populate it with um, with the voltage and current and the length of the trace, and 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 it'll even tell you if you're uh, using traces on the outside layers or on the inside layers, because the heat dissipation for inside layers is mm -hmm. much worse. So the um, current capacity will be less on the inside layer. Um, the, uh, the question about the auto router for a design of this size, the the there's really no point in using the auto router, frankly, because we were handcrafting the primary uh, path of the DC power, and uh, the rest of the circuit was just so easy. We we didn't use the auto router. Um, I've used the auto router on other uh, projects where where things are much tighter, but uh, but it wasn't used on this one. Uh, let's see another question here. What's the little circuit at the bottom right corner of the board? Oh, good question. So um, this is a switch and an LED <laughs> at the bottom right. So uh, one of the pins on the microcontroller is hooked up to the switch, and one of the pins is hooked up to the LED. And under software control, you can decide what those are used for. The default application for for them is to uh, control the state of the relay manually. So the, the, the relay is controlled by the Arduino, uh, and there may be a time when you want to shut the circuit off or turn the circuit on manually. So uh, you just press that button, and the Arduino will detect the switch closure, and it will manually uh, engage the relay in the on or off state and just toggle back and forth. And then the LED will uh, will follow and show you if, if the... Uh, circuit is on or off. So th this actually could be used for another application. If, for example, you have um, a bunch of equipment at, a, at, at your home station or in, in a vehicle, and you want to have one button power on and off for the whole station, you can use that power relay not just for the low voltage disconnect, but just to enable the whole system. So uh, you could just pull a pair of wires off of the board where that uh, switch is and mount a big switch somewhere else. And um, you know, you imagine sitting down at your operating position you hit the big button and the whole station comes up uh, and is powered on. And then when you're done, you press a button and everything gets shut off. So, so that button is is uh, there for that. But of course, it's it's um, uh, software controllable, and you could reprogram that to do something else if you like. Uh, let's okay. see. Um, uh... 
mix of right mm -hmm. angles, uh, T's and 45's. Uh, it's 45 only, <laughs> obsolete advice, or just not appropriate to this design. Well, you know, that's an excellent point. Uh, I, I'm a little um, picky about some of these things. I generally don't do 90 degree routes uh, unless the traces are really thick. So I, I tend to do, um, you know, angled routes uh, certainly no acute angles. There's what, what you'll never find an acute uh, angle. The the closest will be a 90 degree, uh, like you see here. Uh, since the traces of the copper is is so thick, uh, that's really not a big deal. Uh, and the um, the frequency of operation on any of these signals is is like DC. So there's no high frequency issues to be concerned about in terminations. So uh, none of those techniques were really necessary in this application. Um, the only acute angles you'll see are going to be uh, um, uh, layer changes, like uh, where you see this one here. George? Um, I generally try to spread things out, too. So um, so this circuit is really uh, needs to be operational in a harsh environment. So the, the theme was to make it operational, you know, make it functional, but also to make the traces as large as practical and with the spacing between the traces as large as practical. Uh, let's see, uh, what are you working on next? Uh, good question. What I'm working on next is doing this one <laughs> again with the right transistor on it. Uh, we've had a lot of discussion about the one missing circuit from this project, which is to um, have a battery charger. So originally we thought about putting a battery charge circuit in this project. The problem with that is that the battery charger is dependent on the chemistry of the battery. So a sealed lead acid battery charger will be very different from a lithium ion or lithium iron phosphate battery. So now we have multiple chargers required and that just got complicated. So we decided to leave that out. So possibly um, uh, look at a separate circuit that, that's a charger, maybe start with a, a SLA charger and then uh, perhaps do a LIFEPO4 uh, charger. Uh, we're also going to go back and redo the antenna analyzer. The current antenna analyzer uses a pair of germanium diodes, which are like hen's teeth. They're hard to find these things. So we'll probably uh, change that to put an amplifier and some silicon uh, diodes as detectors in there instead. So we'll probably revamp that. I've already spoken to the designer of the circuit, uh, Barrick, and he's, he's working on that. So I think both of those we'll see in the fairly near future. Uh, we also did a power pole outlet strip uh, that has four power pole jacks on it. Uh, we've got one with uh, with seven, so that's a big upgrade to, to seven power pole jacks. So that's that's coming next. So uh, those are the ones in the immediate future. Yes, and, and Rod <laughs> says power pole the world. Yeah, so in, in ham radio land, every vendor of every piece of equipment uh, puts their own weird plastic connector on the 12 volt power line and so a lot of us, and uh, Rod is no exception here uh, in the chat window, uh, we snip off all of the connectors that are proprietary and replace them with these power pole connectors. And that way there, there's a universal interoperability. So that's a, that's a big tip. They're, they're good connectors. They're not that expensive. They're easy to put on. You can crimp or solder them. So they're very, very popular. And uh, a lot of manufacturers are starting to put them on their equipment. So it's really become the standard in the ham radio world. And you do see a lot of that in other 12 volt applications as well. So let's see, are there Thanks. any more questions? I was thinking maybe you want to put your handle on the on the chat there, that way people who contact you, uh, uh, George. Sure. Um, let's see. I'll figure out how to get over to the chat. Yeah, so you could reach me, uh, George, at mradio360 dot com. Uh, you can also follow me on uh, on Twitter at KJ6VU, which is my ham radio call sign. And uh, let's see, William says, uh, will the recording be available? Yes, it will be available. We uh, we did record the session, and uh, it just takes us a day or so to for marketing to go ahead and uh, render it, and we'll make it available on our Facebook page, and we'll get links to you, and through our Twitter page as well. And we'll share that with George as well. So we've got a bunch of other projects further out that we're thinking about. So as we work on those projects, we'd be happy to share those on our website and also uh, with Autodesk uh, 
that would be great. So we're looking at some ways to do that for the future. So hopefully there'll be more projects coming down the pipe. Excellent. So just to kind of go over what we've covered today, we've seen obviously the design of high power DC. You know, in high power DC, because the frequencies are low, you can leverage the thicker copper. If we were dealing with very high frequencies, then skin effects would dominate and it wouldn't make a difference how thick the copper is. You would have to resort to having multiple traces in parallel. Um, we also covered the operation through the various FETs, how it uses a, an important LTC component to be able to do the, the switch and the uses for equipment like this. So definitely we hope that all of you saw the importance of being able to set your width in proportion to the current that you're going to be processing, um, which was something that George did, especially in if looking at the design, we see the power path where the really high currents are running. It's very easy to tell from looking at the design. So that's something that we want to keep in mind whenever we deal with high power uh, circuitry. So we want to thank George for taking the time to be with us and, and sharing this design. And um, I'm also going to kick it back to Ed. Thank you very much, George. I greatly appreciate you joining us. That was really good information. Of course, this is one of those areas which, um, as a maker, you definitely want to dab into as well. Uh, we will be having some more webinars throughout the month, so you uh, look out for those emails. The recording will be available shortly, and we'll go ahead and send you notifications of the as soon as the recording is done. I strongly recommend, yes, as uh, Steve said, to go ahead and make sure that you listen to the podcast at the Heim Radio 360, which uh, George Safaropoulos is one of the co-hosts. So if there's no other questions, I want to make sure we thank you for joining us. Make sure that you um, sign up for our newsletter and join us for our next one uh, next month. Okay. Have a great day. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Thanks very much. Thank you, George. Appreciate it. Have a great one. Have left the conference.